Gates, doors, and keys. Gates, doors, and keys is the title of the message tonight. And we're going to look into the Word of God. It's interesting to learn how much the scriptures have to say about gates, doors, and keys. Did you know, by chance, that the scriptures use the word gates 419 times? Wow. How many messages have you heard on gates? There's 1,100 plus pages in most Bibles, depends on how you format it. 419 times on gates. Doors, 263. Keys, 8. Only 8 for keys. He wants to give you the keys to the kingdom. Amen? Well, let's just find out briefly what gates are. Gates mean a way of entrance, space inside a gate. It also deals with a public meeting place. It also deals with the marketplace. So when you possess the gates of the enemy, you begin to possess places of public meeting, places of influence, places of political voice and authority, places of marketplace where commerce occurs. Do you think that's a pretty good place to possess as believers? The word doors, it means an entry. It also means entrance, an opening, a place. It can also mean, by extension, a gate. It also means a vestibule used of any opening like a door, an entrance, way, or passage into it's a door through which sheep go in and out. The name of him who brings salvation to those who follow his guidance. Jesus is the door. An open door is used of the opportunity of doing something. The door of the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a palace, and it denotes the conditions which must be complied with in order to be received into the kingdom of God. And the word key, used eight times, it is a key, and it also denotes something that has the power to open and to shut, to unlock and to lock. It denotes power and authority of various kinds. Keys denote power and authority of various kinds. When I was in prison, there were guards and they had keys. And they could open and they could shut. And we would have to stand at a locked gate because we had 10 minute moves in secured facilities. So all the inmates would wait for the person with the key who had the authority to open and to shut. To lock and unlock so that we could go through the door or through the gate. After 20 years, I saw a guard with authority use his key, and he unlocked the doors. And I walked out of that prison, a free man. So do keys have significance? You have car keys. They let you in and out of your car. They start the ignition, don't they? They enable you to drive. They deal... I see a lot of women now are wearing necklaces with keys on the end of them. They're becoming very popular. And they're symbolic. I saw a, a girl yesterday, she was a server at a restaurant, and she had a chain around her neck with a padlock around it. That was hers. And not really my thing, but the person <laughs> at the table who was next to me, he said to her, he says, who holds the key to that lock around your neck. She said, my boyfriend. And I thought, well, that's interesting, you know. He's got authority. He's got a key. She's got a padlock. Again, not my thing, but just interesting, the symbolism of it. You know? 
And so today we're talking about gates, we're talking about doors, and we're talking about keys. If you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, and we're going to begin in the law of first mention. The law of first mention is the first time something is mentioned. And so there's significance in the law of first mention because it kind of sets a pattern in the scriptures for what that thing means. Like if you figure out the first time faith is mentioned or the first time a twin is mentioned, there's just so many different key words that you can go through the scriptures. And you can go into a concordance and go back and find the first time it was mentioned and it's very symbolic. Why is Genesis one of the most significant books in the Bible? It's the book of beginnings. Mm -hmm. And so many things are mentioned first there, and they set a pattern in the tone. So Genesis 22, verse 17, and just to kind of set the framework here, um, God is testing Abraham with his only son Isaac. And he's willing to bring the knife up to sacrifice his son. And when he's willing to obey God to do that, God himself provides the sacrifice. A ram is caught in the thicket, and he no longer has to give up his only begotten son, because the Lord then provides himself a lamb. Symbolic there, isn't it? We can see what happens later on Calvary. And looking back 2,000 years ago, God himself provided, didn't he? The sacrifice. So after this occurs, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham, verse 15, out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you. And in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. The seed of Abraham, which came through Isaac, which came through Jacob, which came through the twelve sons of Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel were formed out of that. And out of that, the long story unfolds through the Old Testament. And finally, Jesus comes on the scene born of a virgin to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Scripture says that we've been redeemed from the curse of the law because Jesus has made a curse for us. Because the promise was to Abraham and to his seed. Seed being singular, Galatians 3 says. Not plural as in many, but seed as in one. So the promise was given unto Abraham and to his seed which is Jesus, and those that get into Christ get the promise and the blessing of Abraham. What is the blessing? Your seed and all those within the seed, those that are born again, get to possess the gate of God's enemies. Amen. What are the gates again? The gate is an entrance. It's a space inside. It's the marketplace. You're not doing well in business? God says you're to possess the gate of the marketplace. You're not doing well in whatever you're doing? God's saying, I want you to possess that area. The word possess the gate of the enemy, the word possess, is the Hebrew word yaresh. Yaresh doesn't just mean to possess. It means to dispossess that's what's there. For example... If I have a glass with water and ice in it, I would, if I wanted to crawl into the cup, there wouldn't be room for both of us. I'd have to dispossess what is there, and it would splash out and I would fill the cup. The point is this. When you go into the land of Canaan, maybe that's not the best illustration, <laughs> but if you go into the land of Canaan, and no, that wasn't in the notes. <laughs> when you go into the land of Canaan, I want you to yarash, I want you to possess the land. I want you to drive out, not live with, the Jebusites, 
to parasites and all the other termites, okay? So you go in, you don't snuggle up next to them, you literally dispossess that which is there, and you drive them out. You yaresh, the gates of the enemy. Scripture says that we're to possess the gates of the enemy, the marketplace, the public place. Every place on planet Earth, we need to take our authority and go in and take the land. Amen. Genesis 28, 17 is interesting also. Because in Genesis 28, Isaac, the son of Abraham, has a visitation. And in the visitation... What happens is he dreams a dream in, Isaac, in, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 12, and he dreamed and dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and the top reached to the heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascended and descended on it. Remember, we are climbing Jacob's ladder, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Remember that? Angels ascend and descend upon the ladder of God. How is it that we have two realms where angels have to descend and ascend on a ladder. They literally live in two realms, don't they? And we're going to go somewhere tonight because we're going to talk about getting into the heavenlies, ascending in the heavenlies, and getting the wisdom keys of God and bringing them back to the earth to use our keys, our authority to unlock people from bondage. Right. To go in, to get through the doors, to get through the gates, and go take that which is rightfully God's back yes. under the people of God. Yes. Right. Is that exciting? Yes. yes. <laughs> Kind of makes me want to shout. <laughs> verse 15. Let's just read the whole thing. And behold, the Lord stood above it, verse 13, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it to you, and to your seed. Verse 14. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Mm -hmm. I want to share something with you about this promise that was given unto Abraham. God says, I will make you the father of many nations, for I have then made you the father of many nations. His wife didn't even have seed conceived in her yet when God proclaimed it. When God says it, he brings it to pass. Mm -hmm. yes. In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Who is the number one winner of people groups on the earth of Nobel Prizes? Jewish. Jews. Jews. Yeah. They make up two-tenths of one percent of the population of the world, yet they yield up like 35 to 40 percent of the Nobel Prizes. Hmm. You think that scripture is coming to pass? Mm -hmm. In you will all the nations be blessed. Blessed. They come up with witty inventions, ideas. Talk about a military. They're, do you know that 20 Arabs statistically die in war for every one Jew that dies in war? Why is that? Could it say, you know, I did time with, with, with Muslim Arabs from the Middle East. And this is what they told me. One guy said to me, he says, the Jews, their God is more powerful than our God. They know it's not the same God. Okay, we all talk, well, well, we all serve the same God. No, if it's not the God that's the character in this Bible, the nature, it's not the same God. You can have gods made of your own making. But this is what he said to me. Now, he wasn't a Jew, and he wasn't a Christian. He was a Muslim, but he was being real. And he said, we were on the battlefield, and... This is what happened. There was no way we could lose. And then he talked about what occurred. Moses and the armies of God showed up. They all threw their weapons down and ran because they were no competition. Because God intervened in the war. Because the fear and the dread of the Israelites came upon the Arabs. They know that their God, they can't win. They know. But anyway, do you see how God will move supernaturally and give you a door of favor or supernatural intervention and he will rout your enemies? See, these aren't just Bible stories. It's the word of the living God. Yes. And what's been before shall be again. Yes. And if you look out 
through history, these same interventions of God have happened for the Jews, and they've happened for the Christians in war. Mm -hmm. Because he wants us to possess the gates of our enemy, so that we can then sit down and inherit all things, and share the good of the land with the people in peace. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. So here's what happens in verse 15. And behold, I am with you and will keep you in all the places whither thou goest, and I will bring you again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you. Verse 16, and Jacob awaked out of his sleep. So here we are, Abraham, we've got Isaac, we've got Jacob, and Jacob's seat. Verse 16, and Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord God is in this place, and I knew it not. Verse 17, And he was afraid with a holy fear, and said, How dreadful is this place! How awesome is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Amen. Gates, doors, and keys. We're going somewhere. Matthew chapter... 16, verse 19. Stop. We're going to go somewhere else. Turn with me to Judges. Judges chapter 3, verse 25. We're going to talk about keys for a second. Then we're going to tie this up in a nice, tidy little bow by the help of the Holy Spirit. Here's what happened. There's a king that gets tricked and he gets deceived behind a closed door. Because a man by the, uh, the name of Ehud, he came to this king that needed to be removed from power. And he said, I've got a secret message I need to tell him. And it's only in his presence. So they patted him down. They did the old pat search. But he had a, a knife, a dagger hidden on his thigh somewhere. Anyway, so he went in and he told the king privately. And as he got there, it says this, And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into the king's belly. Verse 22, chapter 3. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed. He was a very fat king. The king was so fat that when he pulled this dagger out, he stuck it in him. The dagger went in and sunk inside the guy's belly and closed up around it. That's a belly. Anyway, um, then he who went forth from the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. And when he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked. We're talking about doors, and they're locked. They said, surely he covers his feet in his summer chambers. That's, that's polite King James terminology for he's using the restroom. He's covering his feet. Okay? In verse 15 or 25, and they tarried till they were ashamed, and behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore, they took a key. First time in scripture that the word key is used. They took a key and opened the doors, and behold, their Lord or their king was fallen down dead on the earth, and Ehud escaped while they tarried. The first time we see a key used, it causes a king to be discovered dead. The second time in scripture we see a key used in is Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22. And it's kind of a prophecy about another king who's coming. And it's a king that will receive a key of authority. And the key to the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none will open, and I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And this shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all the vessels of small quantity from the vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of black. And that day saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be. And it goes on, but here's the point. The next time the word key is used in Scripture, it's used of opening and shutting. Who received the key to the house of David? Jesus. Jesus. What door he shuts, none can open, and what door he opens, none can shut. Now, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 9, 19. 
Jesus now comes on the scene. Let's just start in verse 13. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Verse 15. Jesus saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, blessed are you, for flesh and blood is not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that thou art Peter, Petros, rock. And upon this rock of revelation, Petra, big rock, Petros, little rock, Peter was a chip off the Petra. Right? He was a little Petros yeah. off the big Petra. Yeah. Anybody ever been to Petra? It's 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 a rock area that strategically, militarily, is very difficult to penetrate. And I had the privilege of going there when I was about 15 or 16 years old when we were on our way to Kuwait, Arabia. We got a chance to go uh, back through Israel and to Petra. And you have to walk down, or at least you did back then, because the rock was like a little narrow... Think, and then there's in the sides of the rock walls were little caves and you could go up there and there was houses inside. Literally, I think it can hold about 300,000 people. During time. It's strategic because you just can't attack the place. So if people come in, you can knock them off one at a time because it's, it's small. So upon this Petra, you are Petros. You're a little chip off the rock. But upon this rock, what rock? The rock of revelation that you realize that I'm the Christ, the Son of living God. I'm going to build my church not upon a person, a doctrine, mm -hmm. this or that, but upon the fact that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. In yeah. me, all things are held together. That's what Scripture says about Christ. Yeah. The Word made flesh. So verse 19 Verse 18, and I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The word church is not a denomination, it's not a building, it's ecclesia, it's the called out ones. It's you and me. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're the church. And turn to your other neighbor and say, you're the church. You are the called out ones. Isn't that exciting? They met from house to house. Who met? The church did. They didn't meet in a church, they were the church that met in houses. Amen. Yep. Isn't that exciting? Yep. You know, some of the greatest revivals that have taken place over the years, if you study church history, they happened in open-air areas. Do you know why they happened in open-air areas? Because the existing church denominations wouldn't allow the preachers with the rock of revelation that he's the Christ and the Son of the living God come back into the church to bring revival. So they had to leave the physical church buildings as the church and people gathered as the ecclesia, the called out ones, and they gathered. And where two or three were gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. And what happened was people that were attending the church building that weren't getting the revelation that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, preached to them anymore. They left the physical building and they went to the non-building and they began to gather. And God began to perform signs and wonders and miracles in their midst in so much that people got saved and healed and delivered. And when they would come into town on their wagons, those that were called into a city that the presence of God would fill an area in the 1800s, in the 1700s, in the 1900s, the power of God would be so strong that when people would come in, they'd get knocked out under the power and the horses would arrive and the people would be spilled out under the power and the horses would continue on and just stop right in front of where they were supposed to. Preachers would begin preaching knowing the glory was going to fall. Hallelujah. Not just another message. Right. But the glory of God, Amen. the Shekinah glory, the weightiness of his presence was going to fall. And they would tell the people that would be young kids or whatever that are getting up in the tree limbs to, to listen to the preacher. He would say, I would encourage you to get down out of the tree when I start to preach. 
I don't want you to get hurt right. if you fall from that tree when the glory falls. My God. And those that didn't fell and didn't get hurt because God Amen. swept them up. He's not an author of confusion. But that's the power of God. See, they had an open heaven. It didn't happen in the church building because they realized that Christ is the Son of the living God. And upon this revelation, everything's built. Amen. Amen. Everything else is just another academic teaching if it doesn't have Jesus as the center and the focus point. Amen. 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 My God. Matthew 16, 19. 16, 18. And the gates of hell. What are the gates? They're the position inside there of dominion will not prevail against the ecclesia, the called out ones, but instead the ecclesia, the called out ones, will go possess the gates of the enemy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. People often tell me, well, you have to be aware of this, or you have to watch that, or, or don't do this, or don't do that. I'm thinking, doesn't the Bible say, taste not, touch not, all these things are a foreshadow? If you've really got the light of the world living in you, mm. come on, sir. Yep. Why would you be afraid of that? That's right. Shouldn't it be afraid of you? Yeah, right. right. Fit, fit, yeah. Fit. You know, before they were baptized yeah. in the Holy right. Spirit in Acts, I feel the anointing. Before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit in Acts 1 8, they were hidden in an upper room. And here's what happened they were up in an upper room, 120 of them, and they were scared of the world. But once the power of God hit them, well. tongues of fire appeared and rested upon each of their heads, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit gave them utterance and began to speak with other tongues, known dialects, 16 different people groups heard them in their own native language. And they came out from the upper room where they were hiding from the world. And they came out boldly. Yes. And began to yes. deeply yes. proclaim the wonderful Jesus. works of God. Yes. And some religious folks who weren't leaning into God called them stumbling drunks. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And those that came to seek God and were leaning into God heard them speak in their own native dialectos their own native language. When you see a move of God, do you think people are stumbling drunks or do you hear God moving in the midst in your own dialect? Amen. Might I suggest that it's not the person that you're watching, but it's the state of your heart, whether you're leaning in or leaning away. Yes. 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 Come on, come yes. on. When, when Jesus was giving up the ghost, some heard God speak. Others standing by said, it only thundered. Mm. How can God speak from heaven and people not recognize it as God's voice but think it just thundered? Wow. Mm. Could I say that maybe some were leaning into God and they heard his voice? Mm -hmm. it. Others were leaning away from God and they dismissed it as just another <clears throat> manifestation. Jeez. Well, well, you know, science says well, there's an explanation for this. A woman came to me one day who was born again, and she said to me, she said, David, you know I'm an intellectual. I said, I know that. She said, you know I love Jesus with all.